Hey there, this is Raimu, and this is part 7 of my Introduction to Rust series, taking it one step at a time. This video is going to cover generics and a few other things. So I'm going to start with where I left off on part 6, and we're going to work on this, make some improvements, and learn a few things. So the first thing I want to introduce in this video is the concept of an associated type for an enum. So let's say, for example, with this structure called item. When you think about it, there are really two variations of an item. Either there is an item or there isn't, and if there is, there's a string associated with it. So like we did before, we could have an enum and have two states, something and nothing. But where do we put that what string? The answer is that variants or variations of the enum can have extra data attached to them. It's called associated data. And there are a couple ways you can define that. So one way is in parentheses, you can just put a type. So now if the item is something, there will be a string that goes along with it. Otherwise, if the item is nothing, we don't have a string. Another way you could do this is to make it look like a structure and then give the string a name like what. And that would allow you to add other things too, like we could have, I don't know, color as another string. So since we're just going to keep it simple in this video, we're just going to use the parentheses way of expressing the attached or associated value for something. So let's go through our code and fix it up so that it works with this new definition of the item type. So let's start here with the constructor. So instead of it being a structure, it's an enum. That means we have to say what variant it is. So we'll say something. And then just like the way the type is declared, we use the parentheses and we put the value instead of the type in pl inside the parentheses. So we'll do the same thing for the right here. Put that like that. Okay, and then scrolling down. So how do we deal with the lack of this present, which used to be a Boolean that was in our item type? There are a couple ways to have it distinguish which variant it actually is at runtime. And one of them is with if let. So you would do this if let and then put in the variant here. So item something. And then in the parentheses, we put a name to bind the actual value to. So here's where we can reintroduce that name what. And then to top it off, we put equals and then self. And so what goes here? There you go. So if the item is a something, it will go into this block and then whatever that something was, the associated value attached to the enum, we will temporarily borrow that or attach that to the name what so that we can use it in the print. If it's not a something, it's a nothing, then we go into the else and we print that. In essence, the variation of item between something and nothing is taking the place of that Boolean that we had called present. And now when the item is nothing, we no longer need that what string at all, and so it's, it's not even present. So it fits better what we intended from the beginning. So next I'm going to introduce another type to replace this string so that I can introduce the concept of generics in a little bit. So let's declare a type enum called fruit. Since what we've been putting in the item so far has been fruit, we'll just put the two fruits that we've been dealing with, apple and banana, and then replace item with fruit. And then we just need to go through and replace the strings with the actual variants of fruit. So fruit apple here and fruit banana here. And scrolling down a little bit more, we run into a problem, but how do we print a fruit? So we introduced in the previous video the concept of a method. So what if we made a method of fruit called display that returns the string that we would have printed before? So going through that again, to attach a method or a function attached to a, a type is with an impl block on the type. And then inside there, we just declare the method. So function display. And then we're going to borrow the self since we only need to use it for a short time to figure out which fruit it is so that we can return the correct string. Then in here, we're just going to do like we have done in the past where we say if let fruit apple equals self, then it's an apple to owned because we need to return an actual string that the caller will own 
or a banana to owned and I forgot to put an else there <laughs> okay so let's run the program to make sure it still works right here so we haven't broken anything yet so let's make this a little bit more complicated to allow me to introduce yet another concept so let's say we have another fruit let's call it a kiwi problem here now is that if we have a banana or a kiwi it's going to say banana so you might naturally think okay let's just extend this to say if let fruit banana equals self and then have a final else that says it's a kiwi and that works only you can see there's going to be quite a bit of repetition there's a lot of complicated structure here going on there's a, a little bit of a cleaner way to do this and that's with a match statement so matches are kind of like switch statements in C they're a way to give a menu of choices in Rust it's a little bit more powerful because the choices themselves don't have to be exact values but they can actually be patterns that match multiple values and we'll see this a bit later so the syntax is match self and then we take out the if lets and we just put the value there and instead of the equal self we just turn it into an arrow and then between them we put commas repeat the process here it becomes an arrow and then for the final else there's a special syntax called underscore which basically is a pattern that matches anything else that we don't already have explicitly listed and I'll need a final bracket there to finish it up so it looks a lot nicer right we have a more compact representation we can even do away with the everything else matching and actually make it explicit one thing that's kind of cool about Rust is if you were to forget an alternative, you actually get a compiler error saying that it's a non-exhaustive pattern. So it'll actually tell you, oh, Kiwi is not covered. The compiler is actually making sure that every possible value of self is caught in at least one of the patterns. So we can do this again where we have this if down here. For in a similar fashion, we can say match self and then get rid of the if let and then turn that into an arrow turn the else into an underscore add a final bracket you can see here the condition to match against really is a pattern because there are many possible values of something depending on what the actual what is and just like an if let what becomes a binding or a variable that we have named that will match the actual value at runtime of what's in the item something now let's go back up to our item type and introduce generics because this type is only useful for fruits. What if we could extend this type and make it useful for many different things that you might have in someone's hand? The way to do this in Rust is replace the fruit with just a generic identifier that can map to anything. And we need to introduce what that T is in the following way. If we put it after the name item in angle brackets, it's telling Rust that this type enum is kind of like a template or a pattern or a guide to making one of any number of types, depending on what the value of T is. So you can have an item fruit, you can have an item meat, you can have an item scroll, whatever you want to have. We'll continue to use fruit for the T for now, but we'll extend this later for other types. So to make this work with hands, we would actually instantiate that generic by putting fruit in the angle brackets so item by itself is like a pattern for making many types and when you put a concrete type in there for that type argument is one, one way to say it then item fruit becomes a specific type okay scrolling down to item to fix this in particular because display is a method specifically on fruit we need to make a very focused implementation, one that only works for fruit. So the way you do that is simply put fruit after item, and it's working again. But hey, this implementation would be kind of useful to use for other things besides fruit. So how do we put something in here like T, where the T could be anything that we can display? The answer is traits. Closely associated with generics, so what is a trait? Let's look back at our implementation of fruit and display and consider well what if we had many different kind of types that could be displayed we would have the 
function looked the same, but the internals would look different. So the way you do this in Rust is by introducing a trait. We'll call it displayable. So basically a trait is an API for one or more types that have a common interface. So you don't put in a body for display, but you declare that anything that implements the trait displayable will have a function called display. So to close this out, instead of impl fruit, we would say impl displayable for fruit. So now back to the report item. To make this work, you'd have to put the T next to the impl, basically to say that this implementation itself is generic. And furthermore, that it only works for those T's which implement certain trait, which is displayable. Now, I get a warning about the fact that I made report item public and the trait is not. So let's fix that by simply making the trait public as well. Essentially what this is, and the syntax does look weird, is it says report item is a method of item, but only for those values of T that implement the displayable trait. And that's important because this display function, the way it's found, is through the traits that it can discover about the type. Now, if you get confused about the fact that we have the angle brackets of T in both places and where to put this, what they call a trait bound, you're not alone. I mess that up all the time. In fact, I messed it up while recording this video. But if you happen to put it in the wrong place, not to worry. Rust will tell you that you did something wrong and you just simply try it the other way and you're good. Okay, so that's a very basic use of generics and traits. I want to point out a couple things that we did are so common that they're actually built into the language itself and the libraries. It's called option. So basically what we can do is replace item with option. And instead of something, we use some. And instead of nothing, we would say none. So we don't need this item type anymore. So everywhere we have item, it's be it becomes option. Or wherever we have something. Some. Now we do have this problem that we can't implement something for option ourselves because option is in the standard library. So to get around that, I'm just going to for now take it out of an impl and just make it an open function called report item. So we have to change up self to say that it's an item, option, again, t, and make the function itself generic. Where t, on a t, where t is some displayable, and then we would put item here, and we probably want to borrow instead of owning it. And then we would remove this option colon colon in front. So did you see the subtle sneaky thing that I did here? We had been using generics for types, and now we also have a generic for a function. Now option is used so often that the word sum is actually imported into the namespace, and so we can just say sum instead of option sum. Now it's looking more like you might see in other people's Rust code. You'll see option quite a bit. It stands in wherever you may or may not have an object. So another thing that we've constructed here that's quite common in Rust is this displayable trait. Turns out there's a trait built into the standard library under the standard format display. And that is essentially the same as our displayable trait, so we don't really need that. And instead, we're going to implement display for fruit. So the syntax for the display function is a little bit different. So what I'll do is comment out what we had for a second and use the implement missing members feature in the context menu of VS Code to put this here. And we'll take away that because we don't need it. And in place of this to-do, we'll actually put the body of our display function from before, take out those comments, remove this part, so the difference between what we wrote and the built-in display trait is that instead of returning a string, we use a borrowed formatter object to turn our object into a string. So one of the methods of this formatter is simply to write a string. And we would just write an apple or a banana or a kiwi in place of actually returning an own string of a banana or a kiwi or an apple. And then down here where we're saying displayable, we just say display. And then here's what's kind of really cool about the display trait is we don't actually need to call a method because print line actually understands when you use the curly braces that as long as the object implements the display trait, 
it will know how to call display on it and turn it into a string for you. So just making sure I didn't make any mistakes, let's run that again. All right. So there's quite a bit more to talk about generics and traits, and this might already be a little bit confusing in the syntax, so I'm just going to play it safe and introduce the, this a little bit at a time. We'll cover more about generics and traits in future videos. But in summary, today we learned about associated data types for enums, and we introduced the if, let, and match syntax and talked about patterns. And we also jumped straight into generics and traits, and we introduced the very common option type and the display trait. Now that we know a little bit about generics, in the next video we're going to cover collections where generics are used an awful lot. So thank you for watching. I hope you'll keep up with this series. See you next time.